Uh, my name is Gwendolyn Loomis-Smith. I'm Phyllis Wyeth, Director of Learning and Engagement. And as I said, we are delighted to have a lecture here today about Maine and New York-based photographer Berenice Abbott. Abbott's iconic photographs are often in every art history course that you encounter, and with good reason. Uh, and this trailblazer is examined today by st scholar Dr. Susan Danley. If you have questions for Susan after the talk, um, please be sure to put them in the Q&A box. We're more than happy to have questions answered uh, by her. So we ask for Q&A, not the chat box. Uh, it's just easier for us to see them there, uh, and so we can answer your questions. To give you a bit of background about Dr. Susan Danley, currently an independent curator of American art, uh, Susan Danley of Brown University had worked in museums across the country over the past 30 years from the Huntington Library and Art Galleries in California to the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts in Philadelphia, the Mead Art Museum at Amherst College and the Portland Museum of Art. Susan is a specialist in the history of American photography and has authored numerous books and catalogs, most recently a photography history, or excuse me, a history on the photography of Maine, along with Libby Bischoff and Maine State historian, Earl Shuttleworth. So without further ado, I present to you, Dr. Susan Danley. Thank you very much. Uh, I am pleased to be here and to talk about one of my favorite photographers, Bernice Abbott. And um, in the course of this afternoon's lecture, um, I'm going to take you on a journey um, from uh, Ohio, where uh, Abbott was born, uh, to the backwoods of Maine via Paris and New York. Uh, it's a rather circuitous route, but I think as we go through this journey, you'll see why many of those aspects of the places that she lived informed her work uh, and make it so important in the history of 20th century uh, photography. Um, could I have the first slide, please? It's a portrait of Bernice um, taken when she was in her 80s, about 10 years before her death in 1993, um, uh, taken in New York by a young photographer named Todd Watts, who we will come back to over the course of uh, today's lecture. Um, she, this was taken in New York, but at the time she was living in Maine. And um, as we shall see through um, looking at these slides, uh, this road to Maine was a, a rather surprising one uh, when we understand uh, her early work. So I could have the next slide, please. Uh, the two images of Bernice in her younger days, these were taken both in the 1920s um, in uh, Paris. Uh, the one on the left is a self-portrait and you can see her standing there with this uh, ginormous box uh, or what is known as a view camera uh, that was um, particularly good for taking uh, street scenes. Um, and it was a big uh, camera that she um, went back and forth using uh, over the course of uh, her career. Although the, that format of a camera um, eventually uh, was reduced down to an eight by 10 negative. So a little more um, manageable than the giant thing you see on that tripod. Um, the Portrait of Bernice on the other side of the screen was taken by an American artist named Man Ray, uh, who was also living in Paris in the 1920s. Um, and um, shows Bernice in front of one of his paintings. He was not only a, a painter, but he was also an important photographer. And he first hired Bernice uh, to work for him as a studio assistant, helping him move camera equipment, um, setting up uh, still lifes and so forth, and importantly, developing his own work. And um, this will raise an important question about how she worked and many other photographers worked. Um, in art photography was a rather uh, new medium. Uh, it really wasn't until the beginning of the 20th century with the pictorialists that we that uh, the American public in any case began to see photography as an art form. Um, what I'm interested in in this portrait by Man Ray is his combination of surrealism uh, and this portrait of Bernice who's wearing this wonderful uh, net like mask that breaks her face into these diamond shapes that are echoed in the composition in the background and the frill of her 
collar um, also echoed in that curved shape of, I don't know if it's a set of gears or whatever it is uh, in the background of the photograph. So from her initial um, introduction to photographer, we see her um, moving right into the world of uh, emerging modernism in Paris in the 1920s. Um, she went to uh, briefly, I'll tell you a little bit about her education. She went briefly to college in Ohio um, at uh, Ohio State University, taking mostly literature courses, English courses and, and so forth, um, but left after two semesters in 1918, uh, quite bored with an academic life um, and moved to New York where um, she almost immediately began to get um, immersed in the uh, visual arts community there. She studied painting and sculpture uh, and just after the end of World War II, um, like many American artists of her generation, she headed to Europe to study art in both Paris and Berlin. Can I have the next uh, slide, please? Um, and it was when she got to Paris that um, she needed to look for a job and she had a little experience doing photography. And she uh, met a very uh, important French photographer named Eugène Atge, and that's a portrait of Atge on the left, taken by Bernice in the mid 1920s. Um, uh, he died in um, 1927. Um, and at that time, he had quite a good reputation um, as a what was called in France in those days a flaneur. He was someone who roamed the streets looking for subjects, not only the the people that were there, but also the buildings. Um, and as you can see from this photograph on the right, uh, that combination, if you will, of people and buildings, um, in the case of the people, they're the mannequins in the window that are um, reflected in her camera lens. Um, uh, but they look all the, the much as, as, as pedestrians um, in the way in which he's composed that photograph. And it takes a while, and I think this is important for you to figure out um, exactly what's going on in the photograph. And that's the sort of touch of modernism that um, Atje importantly uh, brought to his photograph. So he's interesting because he's not only a documentary photographer that is recording the buildings of Paris, um, but also suggesting things that are modern and changing. And of course, nothing changes more than clothing and particularly women's clothing. So being a la mode um, is the case of these mannequins um, is very much an indication of, of being uh, of the moment um, in terms of his approach to photography. Can I have the next one? Um, these two images, one on the left is of a, a, a Paris street scene. Um, and you have to remember that um, when he began photographing in the, late teen, in the late 19th century, that taking pictures of things that moved was almost impossible because of the longer exposure times. So his, uh, a lot of his street scenes tend to be void of people, or as in the case of uh, suggested in the Abbot, people that are standing still in the streets. That's why the mannequins were a perfect subject for him. Um, but the, aside from the people, the things that um, attracted Atje were the was the old Paris, um, the smaller uh, narrow streets, the old uh, buildings um, that uh, still remained, and but were in the process of being uh, torn down and transformed as the boulevards were opening up and Paris was being reconstructed. Um, but it's a backward looking um, aspect of his work that um, I think first attracted Abbott. Um, and you can see the, um, the relationship between their work um, with her photograph on the right. Uh, in her, her case, it's not a street scene of Paris, but it's of New York. Um, but unless I tell you that, it's really hard to know. It could be just as well an, an J photograph taken in Paris um, of a man. I don't know quite what he's selling or, or carting around, um, but this idea that it's manpower, um, it's the physical force of man as opposed to the machine that is um, the central focus of her, of her work at this point. Can I have the next one? Um, the brief literary uh, background that um, Ohio, uh, very much um, writing. And um, when she first moved to New York, she began uh, to meet many of the avant-garde writers in New York. Uh, and one of those that she met was uh, Edna St. Vincent Millay. Um, and this is her portrait of um, Millay, um, uh, taken, uh, I think, in New York, but most of her portraits of, of the poet um, were taken in Paris in the brief moment when their uh, uh, times overlapped there. Um, uh, 
uh, among the other literary um, people that uh, Abbott photographed uh, during this period in Paris um, were uh, a number of important um, literary figures, including James Joyce, Dejuna Barnes, um, uh, Sylvia Beach, Janet Flannery, and you'll notice that a lot of them are women, and um, uh, her interest in women writers was extremely important. Um, this is really the first moment when the avant-garde is equally populated by women and male writers, and the women were really uh, beginning to be on a par in terms of their recognition by publishing houses and the public uh, as important forces in, in the modernist uh, movement. Um, when Abbott took this portrait, she talks about um, that most of these images were taken in one session um, and that sometimes she would have to sacrifice, I think what she thought of as the standard um, portrait approach to portraiture of, of for celebrities, and that is to make them look um, poised comfortable, uh, sure of themselves. And instead, what does uh, Abbott present us with someone who's A, very young, um, and you have to remember that um, uh, Edna St. Vincent Millay um, really came to the fore at a very young age. She was 19 um, when she first um, uh, wrote uh, her poetry that drew uh, public attention. And I just wanted to read a little brief uh, segment of one uh, poem that she wrote and the reason that I'm reading it is that it's a poem about Maine. And I have thought, begun to think after uh, looking just a little bit into the relationship between the two that, that the connection between the poet and the photographer may have been Abbott's first connection to Maine. In any case, I'm just gonna read you a few lines from a poem um, that uh, um, was called uh, Renaissance. Uh, and it's about mid coast Maine um, and basically um, where the Farnsworth is. And I think you'll understand that when I um, get to the end of these uh, couple of lines. All I could see from where I stood was three long mountains and a wood. I turned and looked another way and I saw three islands in a bay. So with my eyes, I traced the line of the horizon, thin and fine, straight around till I was come back to where I started from. And all I saw from where I stood was three long mountains and a wood. That sense of simplicity, the connection to the landscape in Maine, are things that come out of um, and the St. Vincent Millay's poetry, but we will see as we get to the end of the lecture, um, they become very resonant in the work of Bernice Abbott as well, particularly uh, in relationship to the state of Maine. Can I have the next one? Um, Abbott stays in Paris. For most of the 1920s, she comes back uh, in 1929 for a brief visit uh, to New York. And what she has with her are all of the Atche negatives, which she saved. When he passed away, there was no particular interest in a, setting up a repository for his work. Um, he was recognized by a number of important photographers, but his body of work hadn't really filtered into the general public or into the collecting uh, public. Um, and at, and um, Abbott was really concerned that the work would be lost unless she could save it. Um, and as she worked for Atje as his printer, she took on um, the so, sort of self-inflicted duty of printing up his work and making his name in the bigger world. So she sets out to, with, to New York with this body of work that she has printed um, and tries to interest the Museum of Modern Art and other dealers and so forth in Atje's work. And slowly over time, uh, in fact, it was a great success. And if you talk to the people in the photography department at the Museum of Modern Art today, they'll tell you it's those, at, those Abbott prints of the Atje photographs that were seminal works in terms of forming their own photography collection. So when Abbott comes back to New York what, for what she thinks of as a brief stay, um, she rethinks it and begins to decide that she's gonna move back to New York. And over the next decade, she worked on uh, photographing streets of New York. And like at Jay, um, she's interested in the transformation and hence the title of the book that is published called Changing New York. It's about the construction of modern architecture of uh, the skyscraper of rising buildings um, and the contrast between the old and the new. And there's, um, it's quite evident in the frontispiece for this book where you get this old stodgy um, 
founder of New York sat down in the middle of Park Avenue and surrounded by these um, soaring uh, modern buildings. Um, the book um, was published in, um, <clears throat> let's see, uh, 1920, sorry, 1937. Um, and as you can see from the front page, um, it was published by the Federal Arts Project of the Works Progress Administration. It's a bit of a mouthful, um, but um, it's generally known as the WPA. And it was a government sponsored uh, depression era um, plan to provide work, steady work for artists who were, of course, um, like many other people, put out of work by the years of the Depression. Um, these photographs eventually went to the um, City Museum of New York uh, and where they are part of their core collection there. Um, and this book became um, an instant bestseller. The other thing to note from this frontispiece of this book is that there's a text to it. It's not just a picture book, but there's a text by a woman called Elizabeth McClausland, who was both an art critic um, and an art historian of American art in the 30s and the 40s, and eventually became a partner's um, personal um, relationship with Bernice Abbott. And the two of them were together until um, McCausland's death in uh, 1965. Um, and we will see uh, over the course of this lecture how that personal relationship um, also affected um, Abbott's uh, professional work. Now the next one. Um, this is probably what, one of the most iconic images from Abbott's uh, work um, called uh, New York at Night. And uh, first of all, the ability to take an aerial view like this, the, uh, an ability of the new cameras and new films to capture uh, nighttime views, nocturnal views, um, and the wonderful abstraction of those buildings um, caused by the confluence of that night and light, um, artificial uh, light, um, is really makes for this wonderful composition that um, really ha is an icon of the progressive view of New York um, in the middle of the Depression, uh, and yet suggesting uh, the future of New York that we've all come to know. Um, could I have the next one? In 1935, uh, Abbott moves to a Greenwich Village loft um, with um, McCausland. Um, and they live there, uh, as I said, until um, McCausland's death in 1965. Um, and it was um, McCausland's appreciation of architecture um, that would also have a great um, effect on uh, Abbott's uh, choice of subjects as well. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Um, and one other thing that I wanted to mention about McCausland is that her politics were um, certainly in the 30s a lot more liberal um, than Abbott's. Um, she was a social a critic for social justice and democracy. Um, she wrote pieces that were critical of the rise of Nazism in Europe. Um, and at, in her own writings about the history of American art, she was just interested in social realism and in photography. Um, and uh, one of her other um, subjects that really brought all of this together in one place was her monograph. This is McCausland's monograph on um, Lewis Hind, who was a very important social photographer um, who worked in Maine at Lewis in Maine and other sites um, dealing with the uh, photographs of, of child labor. Um, I think that the photographs that Abbott takes during the same period don't have quite the political um, pointedness of McCausland's work or Lewis Hind's work, um, but nonetheless, um, we can see the city of New York uh, uh, in various ways. Um, this is a view of uh, Manhattan uh, from Pier 11, and clearly the importance of New York as a port is a very important part of its history. Um, and um, uh, But what she emphasizes is not so much the labor that goes on at the pier, but the, sh the formal shapes of the buildings, of the pier itself, of the, um, the box, um, in, a, in a kind of stick um, composition. And the next one. Next slide, please. There we go. Um, but it's not always a static view. And one of my favorite photographs from this book is this um, image of the Hellgate Bridge in uh, uh, 
spanning um, from Manhattan. Um, and the two different types of bridges, um, one with a sort of Gothic um, centerpiece that holds up the modern built, uh, bridge in the background, and then this more um, uh, backward looking uh, curved bridge, uh, steel constructed, however, um, uh, of the Hellgate Bridge in the foreground. But again, abstracted shapes. And in this case, um, it's important to note that they're being integrated with the landscape itself. That is, they're the things that connect Manhattan with the rest of the state of New York that commit that connect the urban part of New York with the more rural part um, emphasized by the trees and the um, riverscape uh, at the bottom of the composition. And the next one. Um, one of her favorite subjects was Penn Station. Um, this from a series of photographs um, taken of the interior. And again, that love of the shape of modern architecture with the curves and the straight lines and so forth is essential um, to the um, understanding of this, the, forms of this particular photograph, but also of the reasons that it sustains us in our interest, the way that, that can a, a modern building can admit light uh, and open it up. Um, but in the same um, uh, photograph suggests the strength of steel that makes that happen. And can I have the next one? Um, all of this led um, to work that Bernice Abbott did um, in New York um, but related to a project that she did for MIT on, um, on science, particularly science aimed at high school physics students. Um, this is a abstract photograph that she took demonstrating the principles of the transformation of energy uh, from one place to another. Uh, and again, uh, very abstract. You have no, if you didn't tell you what the title is or where, why she took the photograph, you would just think this is something that was taken yesterday by some you know, a computer or something. Um, it is completely devoid of any um, reference to the visible world. Um, it's all physics and it's all abstracted um, in the way she approaches it. Um, those photographs, by the way, have been extremely popular. They were just uh, brought together again for a wonderful show that was at MIT a couple of years ago uh, and remain at the core of any collection of Abbott's work. And um, this is just a little aside. Um, all of the slides that I'm showing you that don't say who the photographer is, they're all Abbott's work and they're all in the collection of the Farnsworth Museum. And we'll get back to the importance of that collection uh, in a moment. But um, so aside from main scenes and New York scenes, and Paris scenes, there are also these science images. Kind of the next one. Um, this is a, a photograph of a parabolic mirror with these very strange eyes in the middle of it. And I'm assuming that the eyes are of some person that was looking into this mirror and that she's capable of, that Abbott is capable of, of photographing it with um, very particular kinds of cameras and techniques. Uh, not only did she do the scientific photography, but she actually sold um, photographic devices that would be able uh, to enable other photographers to take such images. But where the sort of artistic source for this scientific approach comes from is quite clear when you see the next image. Um, and this is a portrait of, uh, of Abbott by um, her mentor, Man Ray, taken in the 20s, where he's used some kind of distorting um, device to uh, make her face seem as if her eyes are on different levels. I'm not quite sure what gadget he used, but it's a, um, a really wonderful um, way of approaching uh, portrait making in uh, the modern age. Can I have the next one? Um, and then lastly, in this series of uh, images from changing uh, uh, to uh, Changing New York, I wanted to show you um, another of her iconic uh, images, and that is this um, scene of the um, uh, Flatiron Building in New York, where she has um, completely cropped out the ground level and only shown you the soaring um, uh, angles of viewing this building, which if you've driven by it even in a taxi cab in New York, um, you know it has a very distinctive presence on the street. Um, um, I want to say Lower Broadway. Oh, I'm right. Um, clearly, I'm not a New Yorker. The paints in the background. A very subtle, but I think nonetheless um, 
important reference uh, for Abbott um, and uh, the surrealists and so forth, that there was no distinction between painting and architecture in the modern world, that all of these things, um, oh, and photography, I meant to throw in photography, um, that, that they all uh, are part of the modern art scene. Can I have the next one? So to make a complete <laughs> um, uh, uh, leap uh, into a, a different direction and one that will take us to Maine, um, I wanted to move from Paris to New York to set, to set the stage for how Bernice Abbott managed to get out of those two environments, that's Paris and New York, uh, to rural Maine. And it all came from a project that she worked on um, called um, US Route One. And she and McCausland um, decided to undertake a, well, basically a road trip from the beginnings, uh, the geographic beginnings of uh, US Route One down in Florida and to follow it all the way up to the Canadian border. So the image that you have on your screen, which is actually taken from a screenshot of a computer of the uh, Wolfsonian Museum, which is part of the Florida in, um, International University, um, shows you um, how a contemporary museum, that is today's museum, um, is approaching uh, Bernice Abbott. So this is their lead off photograph um, for their thing. And clearly because they're all related to Florida, um, they wanted to pick one of the Florida scenes. And this is one where the signage, of course, um, tells the whole story. And instead of being in the background as it was in the Flatiron Building, she's moved it to the center ground. And it says, have your picture made in one minute on Ferdinand. Well, that's Ferdinand the bull in the background. And I'm only guessing that people were asked to um, either stand by that enormous animal. I don't think they actually mounted him, but anyway. Um, so there's this odd mixture of the modern world in terms of the car, which backs up the bull, and then this giant bull um, being tended by someone, I think, reading a newspaper. Um, on the grounds of some place in Florida. And that sort of surrealist aspect, that surrealist sort of touch of humor that um, Abbott is so well known for comes out in these um, wonderful images. Um, this exhibition of, about US Route One has been circulating for decades. Most of the photographs from the US One um, project ended up at the University of Syracuse in New York. And some of you may, if you're a Mainers, may have seen the version of it that came to the Portland Museum in I think the year 2000, just before I myself moved to Maine. Um, and uh, it is a show that has really made um, not only um, museums up and down the East Coast, but has been shown all over the United States uh, as a quintessential aspect of uh, Abbott's mature work. Kind of the next image. So the project took them, as I said, from Florida up to the Canadian border. And here's the one of the last shots taken uh, at Fort Kent uh, at the beginning of Route 1. Um, and um, what you see is the very modest US customs um, uh, station there, which is attached clearly to an old 19th century house and probably placed in front of the railroad, local railroad station. Um, but I just wanted to note that even though there are these sort of references to the past, um, that wonderful bridge in the foreground um, with the girder so prominent in the composition that slices literally across the front plane of the image um, tells you that this is a photograph um, of the 20th century and not just, and the car as well, uh, not just something that's backward looking, but it balances out the two in terms of the composition. Can I have the next one? Well, Abbott and McCausland worked for two years on this project and it produced over 2,400 negatives. Uh, as I said, most of them ended up um, in um, at Syracuse. Um, and this is one of the iconic images and I, it's one of my favorite Abbott photographs. It doesn't shout at you, it's very quiet. Um, it's something that looks at, uh, ironically, at, at, at at things that we still face today as part of Maine, and that is um, the relationship between the landscape and development. And the fact that the lone gentleman in this photograph is sort of walking down the roadside. 
Island to the middle on the right hand side um, just reminded me uh, as I went to vote uh, two days ago about how um, power uh, and the main landscape represented by the trees, the robust pine tree and then the poor little spindly thing next to root one sign. Um, these are all very subtle ways that Abbott tells a story in what looks nominally like a very mundane, ordinary street photograph. It's packed full um, with meaning, but in a very quiet way. Can I have the next one? Um, so when she begins um, looking through the state of Maine, she's, you know, she stopped to do the final photograph up uh, on the border. Um, what is surrounding her there, of course, is potato country. Uh, and um, this is one of her photographs um, from 1954 uh, at the uh, start of this project or at the end of this project of a, of a young boy um, picking potatoes. Um, and of course, you don't see any agricultural equipment here. It's all done the old way. So big barrels uh, held together, not by even metal, but by, I don't know, some kind of um, organic material that's holding the stays together. And this boy picking through um, the rocks and the turned over earth to find uh, potatoes um, to take home. Can I have the next one? Um, she comes back to Maine. She's so interested in this culture of, of potato farming in northern Maine. She goes back to Arista County in a, a decade later uh, and takes this other wonderful photograph where the barrels are still the same. Uh, and now um, it's men and, and high school kids who are picking the potatoes um, pretty much the same way it is today in Arista County. Um, and the landscape takes on um, uh, the dominating view here and the way it undulates and she uses the perspective of the receding lines of the um, fields to suggest the uh, vastness of um, this area. Um, but importantly, just to the right of that dark figure in the middle ground, uh, you can see a, a, a motor vehicle going off, um, followed by a lot of dust um, uh, off of the land. So already there's a suggestion that we, although we're still sort of in Maine rooted a little in old practices that new ones, um, contemporary ones are there as well. Can I have the next one? Um, so when she comes back to New York, or, or excuse me, back to Maine, um, after completing uh, uh, her stint in New York, um, she's looking for a place to live. And she lands in a place called Blanchard, Maine, which is a bit of a, the back of beyond. Um, it's not too far from Baxter State Park. And this is a photograph that um, Abbott took of Baxter State Park. Um, and what you see in the foreground are hikers. Um, this is also the beginning, Blanchard is near the beginning of the Appalachian Trail. So it's really that place in Maine that marks um, the end of a wilderness trail, the importance of that Appalachian Trail is, is um, very real even today if you go up there. I had a nephew that just hiked up, uh, hiked the whole Appalachian Trail and he called me up and I said, where are you? And he says, I'm in Blanchard, Maine. And I went, you're kidding. Um, so it's still at the heart of what we consider the wilderness in Maine, even though it's got hikers. Can I have the next um, image? Um, the rise of a Baxter State Park, its um, tr uh, transformation into a state park from private lands, um, its popularity with hikers, and then finally with American artists, painters, as well as photographers, uh, comes about really centered on the art of Marsden Hartley. Um, this is one of his paintings of Mount Katahdin from 1942 that, as you can see, is in the National Gallery. And I've got on the screen along with it um, the cover of Elizabeth McCausland's monograph on Hartley. This is one of the first um, modern monographs published in the United States, and McCausland was hired by the University of Minnesota Press to do this book. Um, and I really think that um, in many ways, um, it was McCausland who prompted um, the sort of, I don't want to call it a change of heart exactly, but a change of direction, if you will, um, for Abbott um, to abandon um, urban America and to find the American roots in the landscape and in the people. Can I have the next one? Um, and one of the artists who preceded her in doing that um, was Edward Hopper. And interestingly enough, this is a portrait of Hopper by um, Bernice Abbott uh, in his studio in New York. But what I love is the old pot-bellied stove um, that you see on the left-hand side. The abstract 
shapes that surround it along uh, vertical, the half curve of the fireplace um, into which it is affixed. And then these sort of blocks, I'm not even sure what they are. Um, and then that's the strange things to the right that stick out with Hopper's hat on them. Um, Hopper always, almost always is depicted wearing a suit. So he looks like a sort of gentleman artist, not like um, you would expect a bohemian artist. Um, and his hat is what's hanging on the edge of uh, one of the handles to his printing press. Um, can I have the next image? Um, so a, a friendship with Hopper and a knowledge of Hopper's work is, I think, essential in our understanding of Abbott's work. This is her photograph, undated, but I suspect from the 1960s, of the Portland headlight. Um, and it shows um, the ocean, but it doesn't show the vastness of the ocean. Instead, it, of course, features front and center a lighthouse, which warns sailors and um, um, anyone out at sea about the dangers and the perils of the landscape. So there's a bit of drama, um, again, tied into the subject of this, um, but also a sort of national presence. You'll notice there's an American flag flying um, by the lighthouse as well. And can I have the next one? And these are all features um, that also appear in Edward Hopper's um, image of the same lighthouse um, done um, uh, almost 20 years earlier, probably. Um, the flag isn't there, but the lighthouse is the predominant um, feature is, is clearly there. And again, that simple geometry that was so emphasized in Abbott's photograph of him is, is very evident in the geometry of the buildings um, and in the lighthouse itself. Can I have the next one, please? Um, so when she comes back to Maine in the 60s, Abbott sets about to sort of figure out what are the iconic views of Maine. First of all, of course, there's fishing. And um, she did a series of photographs of um, uh, lobstering on Matinicus Island in the mid 60s. And this is just one of them, the gut that refers to that body of water that is flowing between the wharf with the old fashioned wooden lobster traps and the body of um, uh, land that's uh, behind it. Um, that free flowing water is um, collects the light uh, in her image um, and really is a wonderful contrast to the shadows cast um, by the lobster traps themselves. And I have the next one. Uh, her sense of humor in <laughs> the flying lobster is one of the uh, discards uh, or rejects as all lobstermen are required to do even up to today. You have to measure the size of your lobster before you can keep it in the trap. And this is um, clearly one that's too small to keep and has been sent set free um, back into the ocean, but um, uh, Abbott could always be humorous in her photographs. Could I have the next one, please? Um, hauling fish, um, this is called a day's catch. Uh, I'm not quite sure there's no location for this one, but it's somewhere in mid coast Maine um, where you see them pulling up the seine nets that are full of fish um, and what hard physical labor it is. Again, not mechanized, but going and relying on the old ways and kind of the next one. Uh, just a same scene from a different view, except in this one, um, that black, um, elephant trunk like uh, appendage on the left hand side is probably something that's sucking in the fish into the hull of the boat. So um, it's a combination of the old and new. And just in case you miss that, um, between the two gentlemen in the center composition is a, um, is a two masted ship uh, in the distance. And can I have the next one? Um, and this subject, of course, was uh, prized by American artists, realist artists of uh, the mid 20th century, particularly N.C. Wyeth, his image of Dark Harbor from 1943 that's in the Portland Museum. Uh, similar kinds of scene. Uh, in this case, they're uh, pulling the, the probably mackerel out of the, um, out of the dory um, with a, uh, the, a little net and putting it into old fashioned baskets. Um, N.C. Wyeth um, looking a little bit more backward than, than Andrew, um, but nonetheless involved in the same subject that is a traditional one and, and identified with the state of Maine. Can I have the next one? Another thing, of course, is logging in Maine. And this is Marsden Hartley's log jam on the Penobscot in the National Gallery. And I think it's important that this subject winds up in something that we call the National Gallery, which really tries to define American art for the first time in their contemporary collecting of American art. And kind of the next one. Here's Abbott's photograph of a very similar scene. And again, the degree of abstraction in her photograph is even 
think that we've done partly where all those uh, logs just flatten out into this wonderful um, recession into nothingness. And we talk about that um, poem by um, um, Edna St. Vincent Millay at the beginning about the um, the subtle horizon lines is something that, that often marks a Bernice Abbott photograph as well. Next one. Um, and again, more abstract shapes. I love the roundness in every aspect of this photograph, of the ends of the logs, of the uh, guts of the, of the um, lumbermen, the roundness of their hats and so forth. Uh, a, a play of, um, of that against the plaid shirt um, is quite wonderful and, and really sort of, um, uh, we sense these loggers, not just only for their muscular strength, but also for the friendship and the camaraderie that reunites them in their, in their um, profession. Now the next one. Um, again, backward looking, in this uh, case, a, um, uh, a uh, draft horse pulling uh, logs. And in fact, this is still um, uh, celebrated in Maine. Um, if you go to the county fairs and all of those sledges that are being pulled by horses and the horse pull um, are references back to when horses really did have to pull very, very heavy loads. Um, kind of the next one. Um, all of these photographs coalesce in a book called Bernice Abbott, A Portrait of Maine. And if you want a, um, a wonderful publication for your shelf, I can recommend um, about and about Maine. Uh, I recommend this book highly. It's um, widely available, fortunately, in used books uh, situations. You can get it on Amazon, um, but it really um, brings together all of Abbott's images of Maine in a way that I think um, still defines the state today. Can I have the next one? Um, and um, I just wanted to contrast um, her images of New York as she's setting out to to turn away from urban America. And um, there's no photograph more telling than this one, um, which is a you know, going out of business sale. And I love the way it says Mayor Walker's order to vacate. So government. Um, uh, regulation about um, sales and the, how people coped with the um, depression years and so forth, um, the loss of jobs, um, the sense of anonymity amongst these people, instead of that wonderful camaraderie that we saw in the picture of the main loggers, these people seem sort of all disassociated. Pick people photographed from the back, um, kind of scowling faces. Uh, times were hard. Can I have the next one? Um, when you look at rural faces in Maine, this is a photograph uh, taken on the US Route 1 project uh, in, I think it's the town of Bridge, Bridgeport? Bridge, it's not Bridgeton, it's Bridgeport. Bridgewater, Maine, um, of uh, Mainers standing on the front porch uh, of the general store, um, sells clothes, shoes, groceries, feeds, um, and, and it's a lot of tea. Um, again, where the signage um, has as much to say as the expressions on the people's faces. But again, it's a sense of a pace of community of where people gather um, and you know where stories are swapped. Can I have the next one, please? Um, Towards the end of Abbott's life, um, like her mentors, um, At Jay and Man Ray, she needed assistance. Um, she had a huge body of work. People were still asking and dealers were still selling um, her early work. Um, and this is a photograph taken by uh, Julia Dean, who was, uh, as she called it in her memoirs, the last apprentice to um, to um, Bernice Abbott. And this is uh, one of her series of general stores, clearly inspired by Abbott's work in Maine. Uh, but instead, Julia Dean photographed general stores all across the country, but it, it could have well come from uh, uh, the hand of Bernice Abbott. Can I have the next one? Um, these are some notes that Julia Dean took um, uh, trying to um, put her thoughts together about um, Bernice Abbott. That's a photograph she took of Abbott and I like the stove in there again, a kind of subtle reference to the wonderful um, hopper uh, image that we looked at earlier. And those are uh, Julia's notes up there about what she wanted to um, uh, what she wanted to say about Bernice Abbott. This is still a work in progress. And I show it to you as a screenshot again, because if you go to Julia Dean's uh, website, um, you can see all the different things that she photographed. Um, and she talks about how important um, Abbott was to her. She went on Julia um, to become the 
uh, center of photography. It is a socially um, um, uh, oriented street photography organization. Um, she photographs lots of street scenes in Los Angeles and in the Southwest and so forth. Um, and taking Abbott's lessons learned in Paris from Aceh, she's transposed them to contemporary uh, um, American photography. Can I have the next one? Um, and sticking with the theme of the storefront, um, I wanted to show you a photograph of a place called Monson, Maine, um, which is best known as a place where Bernice Abbott hung out. She actually lived in Blanchard, which is eight miles down the road, but her legacy in Monson was quite real. And if you go to the Monson library site, um, the librarians talk about Abbott coming into the library and what she was interested in and so forth. The poor town of Monson, although it was based on logging early on, um, had lost much of its um, economic basis over the years, and many of the stores had closed and shuttered until recently when the Libra Foundation, started by Betty Noyes, who's another uh, important figure in um, the uh, Farnsworth exhibition, and you should um, uh, have a look at the catalog for that show, which talks about Betty's contribution, but it's an ongoing one, even though she died. The Libra Foundation that she set up has, as this um, uh, magazine article in Downey suggests, has poured in more than $10 million into buying up the uh, closed storefronts in Monson, Maine. Um, and if you go there today, you'll see that it's full of artist studios. Um, there are buildings that they have set aside as artist residencies and anyone from the country can apply. It's not just for Mainers. And um, unlike many of the other short-term residencies in the state, uh, the one in Monson provides year long uh, residencies with funding, with activities um, where all of the artists uh, can compare notes and talk to one another and experience the rural Maine that Abbott so loved um, in the later years of her life. Kind of the next one. And the other way that her legacy has been extended um, into contemporary times is through the work of those, um, her apprentices and those who knew her. These are two photographs by Todd Watts, um, the fellow who took um, the photograph um, that I showed you at the beginning, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But as you can see, they're very different from her work. He works both in black and white and color, um, but he abstracts nature. He doesn't have that sort of narrative element very often in his own works. But these are two um, photographs from his series about the weather in Monson, Maine. Um, so you get a sort of wintry black and white, uh, you get a springtime or summertime one with the lily pads and so forth, but, but very abstract and all of that abstraction defined by trees. And I think that's a very important um, element um, that he learned from Bernie, Bernice Abbott when he was photographing for her. And then one more, next one. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I just popped this in. This is these are uh, photographs by uh, that um, uh, that are in the collection of the Portland Museum of Art. There's the Todd Watts. The one on the left is the contact sheet for that portrait that they got. Um, they also own her prints of At Jay's photographs. Um, uh, another portrait of her by a main photographer named Stuart Noodleman. Uh, and then one of the 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 most popular ways in which her work is known today, and that is through portfolios of her work that is sort of compendium of her best hits, if you were, um, put together by various dealers. And this one was put together by Whitkin Burley uh, in New York and London of uh, Abbott's work. So there are 41, record, uh, 41 photographs by Abbott in the um, Portland Museum and, um, ooh, I've forgotten the number that's in the Rockland Museum, but it surpasses that by a, a great deal. Can I have the last slide, I believe now? Yes, uh, and this is a photograph uh, by Bernice Abbott, uh, printed by Todd Watts um, and taken at one of the, of the uh, country fairs in Maine um, called Boys at the Fair. Um, and as you see, it uses all of Abbott's photographic vocabulary, the uh, upward uh, angled shot, the use of letters uh, and these wonderfully expectant um, and determined faces of the kids of Maine um, that all of us get to see if we if we go to the um, um, Common Ground Fair. Um, so that's the, some of my comments. You can see Abbott's work is wide ranging and I hope you will take the opportunity as you travel around to um, notice her work whenever you see it on view. And now if we, want to, if we have any questions, I'm happy to ask, uh, answer them to the best of my ability. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much, Susan. It was just really a 
fantastic talk and has given us so much to think about. I have to say, I really, of course, enjoyed um, hearing that there was a potential connection with Edna St. Vincent Millay for the first time that Bernice was, was getting acquainted with uh, Maine and uh, the surroundings there. So let me see if some questions are rolling in. I'm sure we've got lots. It's a question that actually I think is an intriguing one. Um, we hear so much about Doc Edgerton, of course, and, and his work at MIT. So if you could talk to us a little bit about, you know, sort of those initial stages of collaboration or how did that relationship initiate and develop? The MIT one? Yes. Yeah. Was Doc it, Edgerton at MIT. Yeah. Um, well, it was uh, Doc uh, Edgerton, who most of your work is, is much better known. For example, some of you may remember the wonderful photograph he took of a drop of milk um, dropping in and then all of the um, directions in which the milk sort of explodes. Um, but I think he came at the taking of photographs more or less as a scientist. And Bernice comes to it and brings to it the idea of combining modern art and con concepts of composition to things that related to the physical world, um, to motion, um, to action, um, causing reaction, that sort of thing. Um, and I think it really, um, and, and the audience for her work was a lot different. Um, some of his photographs get published in the popular magazines of the day. She was doing her photographs for textbooks. Um, and it's amazing that um, such um, finely crafted imagery found its way into a scientific textbook. And she did it on purpose because she wanted to interest people who were to draw the, the interest of people in the, in the sciences into the arts. And I don't know that he was exactly interested in that. Um, she's always got the artistic side um, as the, in the forefront of her imagery. Sure, that, that, certainly, that certainly makes sense, but it's interesting how much uh, his name always comes up. And so, and so the, the photographs at MIT of hers, I mean, I mean, I think certainly big fans of Bernie Sabat know those photographs and scholars, but I think those generally are not sort of in the normal canon, if you will, of, yeah. of knowledge base. No, and I have to say, when there were reviews in the Boston paper, that was the thing that amazed everybody. Where did these come from? And oh, look, they're by a woman photographer, you know. Um, and they were truly amazing. Um, and so uh, she's gotten her due, and I'm glad that you guys have a couple of them anyway in your collection. Absolutely, absolutely. They're, no, they're some of my favorites. Um, so, and I'm glad that there's some favorites too here in the, in the audience today. Uh, and somebody actually also had a question about uh, the relationship again between Bernie Sabat and uh, Edward Ajay and how that started. Oh, how that started? Or, or, uh, how, well, the, or how, the, how they became associated or how Bernie Sabat became associated with Edward I don't Ajay. really know the details of how she actually met him. Uh, all I know is that his photographs were very much admired by some of the more progressive modernists, even though they didn't really have the same formal issue. They weren't sharing formal issues. They just um, were inspired by his willingness to look at scenes that weren't necessarily considered artistic. Um, and they very much valued um, uh, his imagery, even though it's, it's a lot more romantic than many of the uh, surrealists were. Um, and I think it was probably through Man Ray um, that uh, he pointed out to her that this is someone she should be aware of. And then when he needed help, she was you know cheap help um, uh, and formed a very personal relationship with him to the extent that he left her um, the photographs at his death because there was no one else interest, no institution interested in them. That's amazing to think of those relationships and how they, st how they start yeah. really. Uh, and, yeah. and certainly the knowledge base that gets created from such a thing. So yeah, I have a question, basically. I have a question here and um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna spill the town name. So what was her connection to uh, and I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, Korea, a case, that's sorry, C-O-R-E-A yeah. and Prospect Harbor. Uh, and just a general comment, in the 1950s and the 1960s, you could pick up one of her photographs at the, in the form of a postcard at the Prospect Harbor uh, post office. Well, so I'm not connection to those areas. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, but Chenoweth, who wrote the text in that book, is from that area. Uh, and so I, I have a feeling it's through her, but that's, those are the two places that Marsden Hartley um, went late in his life. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if she went up there, but I've never found anyone that mentions 
them actually working um the working on the Thanks, Susan. We lost you for a moment. We've got oh, you back there. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yep, we can hear you. Perfect. So, um, Chenoweth, um, who did the um, the text for the um, Bernice Abbott's book on Maine, um, lived up there, and I think that's how she got there. Whether I don't think she would have known uh, Hartley because he died um, before she was spending any time up there. So, um, but she certainly knew his work um, uh, through her partner. Great, great. Thank you. You've got lots of questions coming in here. Um, as, as long as we're talking about sort of relationships and beginnings, uh, the question about the professional relationship between uh, Ms. Abbott and Alfred Stieglitz, had there been any sort of professional relationship there? I mean, certainly we think of the very sort of, um, you know, well-known uh, sort of aerial photos and other photos that seem quite similar in a sense, uh, Flatiron and other other photographs, but was there a professional relationship there? Um, she was never in his stable of artists. Um, I think they knew each other's work, um, but she's not say as close to him as somebody like Hartley or Paul Strand, um, who were you know, artists that he ch uh, championed in his writings and so forth. And uh, my, I don't really know if they would have, in the twenties when she was in New York would have been the most likely time that their paths would have crossed. But that's really prior to her work in the thirties. And by that time, um, uh, you know, O'Keefe has sort of moved off to uh, um, uh, Santa Fe and Abiquiu. Um, and so he's less interested in women artists and, and so forth. And she was, pretty outspoken and so forth. And I kind of suspect that their personalities are a bit like oil and water. And I can't imagine that she would um, have agreed to do what he wanted to do. She had a very interesting relationship with her dealers though. Um, um, uh, Ronald Kurtz who gave the, uh, all the, her photographs to the Farnsworth was her dealer. And he only represented two people, <laughs> her, her estate and that of, um, of Arnold Newman, the photographer. Um, and Arnold Newman has a connection to Maine through the Maine Photographic Workshops. Um, and I think it's quite interesting that, he, that Kurtz thought it very important that there be her work represented in an institution in Maine. And I'm so glad that he made that selection that was a little broader than just the Maine subjects to give um, people here an idea of her whole career, not just, ju not just the views in Maine. Um, so that's really important. Um, and now she's represented by Howard Greenberg's gallery, if anybody's mm -hmm. interested. Um, and he has a very good website about her work and so forth. Great, great. And there's a question about, um, there's a Susan Blatchford in Blanchard. I don't know that name, but maybe that sounds familiar as if there was a relationship between Berenice Abbott and some sort of uh, connection between the two. I am not familiar with the person, so. Okay. Can't speak to that. Okay. Um, and it sounds like, you know, obviously there are really good sources out there. Obviously you've talked about the Chenoweth book and, you know, um, some really fantastic exhibitions that have been done on Bernice Abbott's work, but do you have a biography out there that, that you think is, is, um, you know, a good one to follow up on for people to want to read more. And also I know that there's a 2018 biography that was published, um, by Julia Van Haften. And I just didn't know if, yeah, that's, that's a very good one. And then the other person who knew her quite well as, oops, his name just went on mad. Hank, um, ah, hang on a second. Hank. Um, well, if you go to her website, um, her biography is her the, her biographer is listed there. So um, just look up Bernice Abbott online, and for some reason his last name has just. Um, but he knew her quite well, and that's probably um, I think a lot of Julia Van Hampton's work is based on his um, interviews with her as well. Perfect, perfect. So I think we had some great um, great questions today, and I want to really thank everyone for. Uh, joining us and and uh, Dr. Susan Danley, it's it's really you know she's such a fascinating artist and 
And again, I think the more that we even look at some of her main photographs where she's looking at, you know, the, the fishermen and sort of logging and all sorts of the, the natural history and the beauty of Maine, I think that's very informative too, you know, as, as we're, we're looking at the landscape and, and really parts of Maine that are less known to people as well. Um, so I, again, thank you, Susan, very much for, for your time and, and sharing your afternoon with us. And I'm so glad about the nature of your show, because it really does show you that it, it takes a village to really bring forth, um, and in this case, a village of women, <laughs> to bring forth uh, some of the important features that often are uh, underlaid um, by some of the better known Maine artists, but she deserves to be up there, you know, with Hartley and, and everyone else who helped really define what Maine is all about. Well, and you know that photograph that we have at the Women of Vision exhibition, that exhibition will actually be up through March, early March oh, of 2022. Uh, so there's definitely still time for people to see it. Um, and again, thank you for joining us this afternoon. And uh, certainly we'll be back here again soon next time online. And always uh, feel free to join us at a studio program online as well, or we'll, we'll see you in the galleries. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, Gwen. Thanks, uh, Susan, very much.